Okay, welcome back everybody. So today we are talking about piezometric uh, maps. In the last video lecture, I reviewed the concept of piezometric head. So the head you'd measure in a piezometer basically. So it's just um, the pressure head plus the elevation. Uh, so for for a water table aquifer, so an unconfined aquifer, the head is typically just the level of the water above some datum um, because it's not pressurized. Uh, if you have an artesian well, you might have outflow, right? So the piezometric head may be above the ground if it's you know under pressure. Uh, so again, it's, it would be the stable level of water um, free to the atmosphere. Uh, here, we are moving to piezometric maps. So these are basically can we map the aquifer underground? That's really what it is. Uh, and again, we'll see traditional methods to do this. Um, here's an example again of groundwater level maps. We need the water levels in a number of wells to do that. So a number of piezometers or wells. Uh, and again, a reminder that you can have an unconfined aquifer here on the left. Uh, and the water level you observe, right, the piezometer the head in the piezometer is just the water level. You just, you know, you dig a hole, you find the water, that's where uh, the stable level is. If you have a confined aquifer, right, so this aquifer here is confined, so now we have a head differential here between, you know, the level and here, so there's some pressure so that the water rises in that well to some stable level, and that's what your piezometric head would be or potentiometric surface would be. If you have a flowing well, then you don't really know where that potentiometric surface would be because again, you're flowing uh, water, so you would have to raise this well up to here to find that stable level. But that's basically what you do. You poke holes in the landscape, you know, measure the piezometric head, and then you can map it out to have the contours, if you will, of uh, the aquifer. So what we want to do is draw contours of equal groundwater elevation. Okay, so this is very akin or similar to a topographic map if you've seen those, right? Where you have the contours of uh, elevation is the same but for the water. Uh, groundwater contours cannot be higher than the surface topography. So again, if you have a flowing well, right, uh, then you cannot have the groundwater contour. It's impossible. Uh, the depth to the groundwater will typically be greater under hills than under valleys, right? So that means that the groundwater roughly follows the contours of topography, typically. Um, if a lake is uh, present, the lake surface is flat, as is the water table beneath it. So the groundwater contours must go around the lake unless the lake is perched on a low permeability sediment and has a surface elevation above the main water table. So in other words, if the lake is not connected, then you know, there might be some aquifer below it. Typically, if you see a lake, you know, this is a surface expression basically of an aquifer. Uh, groundwater contours form a V pointing upstream when they cross a gaining stream and bend downstream when they cross a losing stream. So most streams are gaining, right? Because that's what streams are. They gain water from the groundwater and then they flow it out of the landscape. So typically streams are gaining, so you'd see those V pointing upwards and you'll see them in a second here. Uh, but sometimes uh, streams actually discharge water to the groundwater. So remember the Kavango uh, example that I gave before, right? So sometimes stream actually infiltrate into the ground and then recharge the groundwater. So it's not always a one-way street. Although typically, again, streams drain the landscape, so they actually gain water. Here's an example of uh, few streams that are gaining streams, right? So you can see those V pointing up, uh, pointing up streams here. That means that those streams are gaining water. Uh, and then they're connected to a lake here. And there's an outflow from the lake. And again, a gaining stream down here. So a water table map of a gaining stream in a lake that is hydraulic, hydraulically connected with the water table. So we'll see another example. And this is again from your book in Fetter, so you can find this example there. Uh, here's an another example of a lake that is not connected, hydraulically connected to the water table. And you can see here, 
right, that there is a water level at 310 that goes under the lake basically and this lake is perched but it's leaking water downstream so it's contributing water to the groundwater downstream and that's why this 300 level is bent you know uh, at the bottom of the lake okay so it's recharging the water table there now, examples of how do you find a hydraulic gradient. So I haven't really introduced hydraulic gradient uh, yet, but the hydraulic gradient is basically the change of head uh, in some direction, right? So dh dx, oops, excuse me, is the hydraulic gradient. Now, this is important because when we do the next uh, course objective, which is really looking at the math and the transport. So the next course objective will be about Darcy's law and Darcy's law uses hydraulic gradient. So basically hydraulic gradient is what drives the flow, right? If the water table is slanted, right? If there's a slope in the water table, then there is flow, right? Down gradient, you go, it's just like a downhill, you know, race, right? If you drop a ball at the top of the mountain, it goes down, same thing for the water. If there's a, a gradient, a hydraulic gradient, the water flows downhill, flows down the gradient. So we want to, typically those um, piezometric maps, right, we use them to find out where the water goes, basically. How is the groundwater flowing underground? That's really what they're used for. Um, so there's two ways you can do that to find a, a local hydraulic gradient. Basically, you can use three piezometers or, of course, four piezometers. It's the same principle, right? So you poke three or four holes look down them, find the piezometric head, find the head down there, and you can see, you know, where the water table is going, right? Uh, so the method is highlighted here on the right. So draw a line that connects each well uh, for the three well setup or, you know, the corners for the four well is the same principle everywhere, right? So now you have that triangle, let's say, for the three well setup. So you draw that triangle uh, let me undo some of these. Okay. Uh, and then you, again, look down them and find what the head is at each of them. So 92, 88, 74 for this example. And then all you do is report. So 92 and 88, right, in the middle, we have 90. Now, 92 and 74, right, you can slice this and you find the 90 here. So 90, 90. And then you join those of same elevation, right? So here we have 74 and 88. So you see how you just graduate basically each of the size of the triangle. And then you find the, you know, same elevation or same head points. And then you draw lines. So what you can see here is that the water is going from 90 down to 85 down to 80 this way. So if you draw a line perpendicular to those ISO heads, then you know what direction the flow is. And that's really what, you know, how you find the local gradient or how you draw a piezometric map or potentiometric map uh, for a confined aquifer. Uh, so again, you can follow all those steps, right, uh, on the right-hand side and draw these lines and find what the gradient is. Now note that the gradient is actually the square root in 2D, right? So if it's a 2D problem, the gradient at a right angle is just the right, the square root, so this is your uh, Pythagorean theorem, right? The square root of dh dx and dh dy is squared, okay? So, and then this is the square root of those two, okay? And Here's another example of a, you know, piezometric map where you can see some streams. So once you draw all the contours of the uh, of ISO heads of, of same heads, then you can see where the water goes. So where you have the streams, obviously we know how the water is. Uh, one of the points here is that if you look at this um, this side of the graph here, you can see that the hydraulic gradient is not constant, right? You can see how those lines are getting closer and closer together. So this is basically a dip, right? So the hydraulic gradient 
becomes steeper and steeper and steeper downhill, that means that the water is going to flow, you know, uh, faster, basically. There's, there's more gradient down there, right? So, you can, so the hydraulic gradient doesn't have to be constant. In, in fact, it's usually not constant. It can vary, right? So you can have very flat parts of the aquifer that, where there's barely any gradient and then, you know, dips um, in the aquifer where, you know, water flows more. Uh, okay, so this is the conclusion of this lecture, and I will see you in the next video. Thank you.